Hello everyone, my name is Stacy Phillip, Marketing Communications Manager with Corteva AgriSciences. I'd like to welcome you to the Corteva Roundtable, Maximizing Your Profitability in the Dairy Industry. Over the next hour, our panelists will discuss what the next five years look like for the dairy industry and how we can maintain flexibility and producer profitability in these challenging times. Questions, of course, are welcome throughout the discussion, so please type any comments or questions into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And on that note, I'm pleased to introduce our panel for today. We have with us Michael Barrett, CEO of Gailey Foods, Matt Groen, Dairy Technical Services Specialist with Purina Cargill, and Ashley Napton, Dairy Specialist with Pioneer. So welcome everyone, thank you for joining us today, and I will pass it over to you, Ashley. Sure, thanks so much, Stacey, I appreciate that. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. I think we have uh, two really great speakers joining me today to discuss uh, kind of an evergreen topic on dairy farms, and that's you know how to maintain profitability or, or maximize profitability, really. Um, and so I think we'll just jump right in because if I'm looking at discussing profitability on my farm, I think one of the first things I want to start out is, you know, on a little more of a high level and talk about what's happening in the marketplace. Um, so I think, Mike, I'll toss it to you first. Um, COVID's taken up a lot of, you know, a lot of the news traffic in terms of what's happening in the world and especially as, you know, in dairy markets. Um, I guess, do you have any comments on that and, and what should we be th thinking about outside of, of COVID really? Well, yeah, that's a good question, uh, Ashley, because I would suggest that uh, COVID uh, is not the only game in town. Recognize that it's um, a fairly substantial crisis that we're all dealing with, you know, personally in our own businesses, on our farms, you know, within our own factories, in the dairy industry, and even broader than that. Uh, but what COVID is, is doing is it's masking some of the other challenges that the industry is going to have and is having. Uh, we can't forget about the Kusma deal is sitting out there and the, uh, the rush into year two. Uh, we had a, a 2020 that consisted of 30 months. We're now into dairy year 2021 already at the 1st of August. Um, so I think that uh, certainly I'm not discounting the crisis of COVID because I know you've had additional speakers with regards to, you know, what uh, is happening from a protocol and process standpoint you know, within factories, within communities. I know you've had speakers and guests on that, but I think that what has occurred is that, yes, we, uh, the Canadian economy is in a crisis, but what we're forgetting about is that there's some underlying foundations and fundamentals that we also have to be concerned about in the dairy industry. Certainly, you know, uh, trade deals are a critical component. So, Yes, we have to be able to manage through COVID. And we've, again, in Ontario, we've seen some tightening of, uh, of gatherings again in, in uh, Toronto and Peel and in Ottawa. Uh, but we also have to recognize that um, we do have some significant challenges over the next two to three years. And we're living them today already within, uh, within the dairy industry. COVID's heightening them. Um, it's perhaps accelerating them. Uh, but certainly those, those elements are still within the, the parameters of the dairy industry. The challenges haven't changed. They've been masked, if you excuse the pun, um, through the COVID crisis, but they're, they're still there for sure. And so what kind of would be those, those top three challenges that come to mind for you then? Well, I had more than three. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but hey. I'll... Uh, I'll uh, so I'm going to just uh, certainly touch base is uh, trade deals for sure. Um, we need to understand the parameters of Kusma and what moving into a restricted ability to be able to um, uh, export Canadian dairy. That Kusma agreement is, is, is going to have a significant impact. We're not seeing it today, uh, but certainly over the next three years, uh, in four years, 90% of the TRQs are going to be granted uh, for, uh, for Kusma. And don't forget about CPTPP, plus the CETA cheese imports continue to be able to grow into our marketplace, having some significant impact uh, over the next uh, two to three years. The second piece, I, I think, is um, um, the, the defense of the supply chain. Um, a lot of, um, um, I would say, significant 
attacks on this defensive supply chain, I'm going to throw dairy within that in the sense of uh, the food guide in the uh, desire to be able to uh, continuously erode the parameters of supply chain. And we don't have to look far to south of the border to understand what a uh, totally free marketplace may look like. So I think that that's going to be a significant challenge. And wrapped up in that is my third piece, uh, is just on the, the, the politics of dairy. And what I mean by that is the elements of making sure that we're aligned, making sure that we have the ability to be able to um, work together as both pro uh, producers and processor organizations, uh, because we will be facing a crisis that in a new Kusma trade challenge environment, uh, we need investment in processing in Canada and the profitability that is there is certainly inhibiting uh, processors from making investment in Canada. We can all, we can sit across the table and we can point fingers and suggest to others how they might change. But the reality is we are dependent upon each other and that investment is processing is gonna be critically important uh, because we have an imbalance in dairy in Canada. The, the desire for fat continues to rise, but the marketplaces are restricted for the solids non-fat and we can't have balance without the other. You can't have growth in uh, dairy fat like butter, for example, um, and not know what to do with the surplus SNF. And it's a crisis that is going to be there and a challenge for us, not only in this year, but next year and certainly for the next three years. No kidding, no kidding. So have you seen COVID change the, uh, the appetite or the planning for investment in the supply chain for dairy? Yes, I mean, certainly what we're starting to see is a very, a much quicker move uh, towards online ordering. Uh, something that some individuals may not have considered uh, at all, but with restrictions on visiting grocery stores, there's been a, a great growth. It's just not Amazon, you know, and uh, you know, getting your packages every day. It's also in, in the, the major retailers who are uh, putting investment into ensuring that. But also on the other side, you know, the other, the, the yin of that yang is, you know, the recent announcement by Loblaws and a following by uh, other retailers that they're going to charge 5% um, handling to uh, dairies for uh, and others, other suppliers. So there's not a lot of profit margin left after you take a 5% handling fee. So that's going to be that kind of tails back into that, Ashley, where I talked about, you know, the ability to be able to make sure you have a fair return on your investment. Uh, because there isn't 5% to give up in the dairy industry. And so therefore, you know, I know it's just not us. It's all suppliers to the Walmarts of the world. It's 1.25% in store, 5% on e-commerce. That's not uh, a number that can be sustained and allow us to be able to continue to make investments. So there, COVID has shifted that. The other piece on COVID is a shift away from the food service into home dining. You know, the retail certainly um, expanded quite considerably in April and May. It's settled back to the same numbers, but we're not seeing the growth in the food service industry. That should be a concern for all of us. We're heading into this thing called, we call winter in Canada, where outdoor dining, it can still be pleasant, but I'm not so sure it's going to be as exciting as it was unless you're, uh, you know, having your frozen uh, milk ice pops or something. It's going to be a different <laughs> And we're heading into that season. And that's going to perhaps take the edge off some of the recovery that we've seen in the food service industry. So there's certainly been has, has been a considerable movement because of COVID. But what it has done is accelerated change. This was coming. It's accelerated it. And that's what we have to deal with, with an industry that is not necessarily quick to change, not necessarily innovative. And we're very small C conservative in being able to make investments. And the reality is to make an investment, if you decide you're gonna order a piece of machinery today to tackle a marketplace, you're 18 months away from being able to realize that investment, so. No kidding, no kidding. Yeah, that's a good point. So I guess you maybe actually already answered this question. I was kind of curious, you know, if we had not seen COVID and we had kind of looked at what the next three years or so of the industry would look like, you know, what kind of things would you have seen? So are those still at play or did those three years just happen in the last 
you know, eight months. Well, Kusma um, certainly would have been there anyway, Ashley, to my earlier point. We had 2020 disappear in 30 days, uh, according to the trade agreement. So that would have happened anyway. But as I mentioned, we have seen an acceleration of the move towards e-commerce. Um, none of us would have predicted a collapse in the food service industry. In fact, the food service industry in Canada would have been and continue to have been the, um, the bright spot uh, in growth in dairy. But if you've been reading or following the media, um, Tim Hortons is sales are down. Who would have imagined that? Um, and what we're seeing is, um, you know, an introduction of American fast food into here as well, which is upsetting the marketplace. Continued consolidation. It's happening much quicker. It's an acceleration of some of the changes that we would have predicted, uh, but they're all, hap all happening very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. So if we were kind of to pull it back down to the, the farm level, you know, the knowledge piece that you bring to this profitability game, game is, you know, what my market's going to look like for the next little while. And from what you're kind of saying, it sounds like I'm going to have to kind of clamp down on that, that efficiency piece of my operation. Would that be a fair statement? Well, I think certainly I, I would think that that's probably been a focus for, for many years for, for, for farms and and you and, and Matt would know more about that than, than I ever would in a month of Sundays. Uh, but certainly um, there's a deficiency on the farm, but I would say in a broader perspective, a perspective, sorry, is to be able to look at being able to make sure that we really have one dairy voice. You know, there's that whole compensation issue from the government that we've talked about. Uh, there's been some compensation to dairy farmers. There's, there's been zero compensation to processors. Uh, we need to be able to make sure that we do speak with one dairy voice. So there's the farm piece. There's also the farmer owned voice piece, which becomes even more critical. And what we need to do is to be able to move much closer uh, towards being able to have one voice, one representative. I know that there are, are still always going to be conflict within the industry between processor and, and farmer. Um, and as a co-op, we kind of try and bridge both the two because we are the perfect solution. There's my, uh, my, my plug for that. So, but um, that element of being able to ensure that we keep focused on what's right for the entire industry is going to be important. Processors have to make investments. Farmers want processors to make investment. And certainly processors want to make sure that farms are, are um, sustainable, uh, that they are profitable because the alternative, as we see witnessed in other marketplaces, is not where we want to be able to go. So efficiency is a critical component. Um, I'll let you guys and, you know, talk about that piece better than I, uh, but certainly I would be advocating for and, and continue to advocate for a one dairy voice that recognizes that this is not uh, us versus them. It's us uh, being able to ch be challenged and, 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 and respond to the marketplace. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. So if I if I ask you kind of one last question, I'm going to bring it back to the shorter term. And, you know, it's probably impossible to predict, but is it fair to say we're still going to see some instability while we work through this COVID pandemic? There's no doubt in my mind. Because um, uh, I know, like, I know when you had talked about, you know, what does the next three years look like? What does the next five years look like? Uh, actually, I'm having difficulty predicting what the next three months will look like uh, because things are happening quicker and, and, and changing. So we're not out of the woods with COVID yet. You know, we talk about the second wave um, and we talk about the, you know, continued restrictions, what that means to industry. If we go into another lockdown, it's going to see even more restrictions. Now, the dairy industry uh, responded well. Um, you know, we had some, we had a, you know, we certainly had a crisis for three to four weeks with being able to make sure we balanced milk supply uh, in the marketplace. Uh, I think the, the total industry has done well, uh, but there's still a great deal of instability that's going to impact what it means for you on the farm and what it means for us as processors as well. Margins are thin. If, um, the amount of money that's being spent by processors in order to be able to make sure that we're COVID compliant uh, mm -hmm. is an incredible amount of money. The only people making money these days are plexiglass suppliers. Everybody mm -hmm. owns plexiglass and um, I should have bought those stocks uh, on February the 2nd. 
uh, not on July the 2nd, so. No kidding, no kidding. All right, I appreciate that, Mike. So if I kind of take from what you're saying, you know, there's still some marketplace turmoil. And as always, you know, we're going to see some more market loss to upcoming trade deals. So it sounds like we just need to be more efficient on farm, right? Efficient on farm and efficient and as processors and innovative on both sides, Ashlyn. Yeah. Ah, innovative on both sides. Yeah. I like that. All right. So I think that's probably where Matt and I can come in and, and talk about, you know, what skills we can, you know, bring to the table in terms of managing some of the biggest costs on farm, which would be those feed costs, right, Matt? Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, managing feed costs is probably one of the most important uh, things you can do when looking at the total profitability and viability of your dairy operation. You know, come January, February, when everybody's meeting with their accountant, the number one question I get is, you know, what can we do to lower feed costs or what can we do in order to optimize our feed cost? And then on every operation, it seems like there's a different, different way of doing that. But what I often encourage producers to do instead of just simply looking at reducing their cost is really talking about optimizing their cost. So looking at that return on their investment or income over feed costs or return over feed costs and you know, really evaluating key ingredients that we have in the rations, maybe taking a step back and going, are we growing the right forages? Are we, do we have the right balance of corn silage and haylage in our ration in the first place in order to have the most profit per acre or the most profit possible on our farm, right? So it's not just taking fee costs into account, it's taking fee costs, it's taking feed inventory, it's looking at the return on that feed cost. So actually, if we, if we look at feed cost overall or that income over feed cost overall, the producers that are in the top percentile, the producers that are mo the most profitable, often aren't spending that much more on their purchase feed, a total feed than the average producer. But what they're doing is they're able to get that extra five, six, seven liters of milk out of their same forages or their same feed. So it, it's a whole kind of connected uh, circle, I guess, right? It, it starts in the field with the management of the crop there. It goes through to the ensiling process. It's picking the right varieties, Pioneer, obviously, choosing the right inoculants, and then managing everything in the barn, right? And it's not just the ration, it's the environment, it's the cow comfort, it's the genetics, it's kind of that whole integrated big picture. And looking at all those things, if we get all those things right, then we can often find key opportunities on operation that we can either reduce the cost or optimize the cost so that we're spending the right dollars in the right place to get the right return at the right time. Love it, love it. You touched on so many things that I think we could you know, delve into further. And I think the first that's been kind of maybe the number one question that I'm getting throughout this summer is, is feed inventories. That's something with a lot of people in Eastern Canada would be struggling with. So um, what kind of strategies would you be sharing with your customers right now to, to manage those feed inventories? Well, the, the first step in managing feed inventories in my mind is measuring, right? We can't manage what we don't measure. So oftentimes producers go, okay, I grow, you know, 50 acres of corn silage because I've always grown 50 acres of corn silage, or I put an X amount of acres of new seeding because that's what I've always done. But, you know, over time with, you know, up until recently before COVID, we've had a lot of growth in our dairy industry in the last five or eight years and growing that 50 acres of corn silage that you did five or six years ago might not actually be enough with your current quota holdings. So what I've seen over time is producers that five years ago always had an excess of feed are always running really, really tight now and they can't figure out, well, why, right? Because we're going only milking, you know, five or eight or 10 more cows than I used to. It's not that much feed, but along with that extra five or 10 cows, we got, you know, a few more dry cows, we got a few more heifers. And at the end of the year, that could add up to a significant amount of feed more than we actually needed in the past. So taking stock of what we actually need for a year, kind of sitting down at the end of the crop year, maybe in the fall, maybe around Christmas time and figuring out, okay, looking back, this is how many animals I'm projected to be milking in the next year. This is how many heifers I'm gonna have over the next year. How much feed do I actually need? That's the first step. The second step is measuring current feed inventories and trying to evaluate uh, 
is it enough? So what I recommend with the producers that I'm working with often is measuring feed inventories more than once a year, right? It's not just checking it out at the end of harvest. It's we're looking at feed inventories every three or four months. And that way we can adjust and be flexible. If we are short on corn silage, okay, we can feed a little bit more haylage. Or if we're in February and it looks like our haylage supply is going to be tight, let's feed a little bit more corn silage for now and then we can readjust that come June or July in order to make sure that the corn silage stretches out well past the fall harvest time so that we can continue to feed fermented feed. Um, also when managing inventories it's important to have enough storage space right so you know often putting that extra investment into another bunker silo or figuring out another place that we can put an extra bag of haylage corn silage or whatever it is is really going to help to kind of build and maintain feed inventories totally makes sense i think one of the questions that i've been getting the most is you know can i move to a diet with more corn silage in it we know that corn silage is you know the highest yielding forage per acre really good quality. It's going to bring lots of starch to the table. From a nutritionist as point, aspect, do you have any concerns about that plan? Uh, no, not really any concerns, but I do have some, some things to consider if a producer is going to go that route. So um, I, I think often, you know, traditionally a lot of guys were feeding 50-50 haylage to corn silage or maybe a little bit heavier on the corn silage, but we can certainly go a lot higher than that. So this morning, actually, I spent my morning going around to guys chopping corn silage and doing shaker boxes on the chop length in order to get it right. And if you're going to be feeding a higher corn silage diet, it's absolutely critical that you do that, right? We want to make sure that the chop length is correct, right? We can't have corn silage that's way too long because then we're going to have issues with rate of passage and digestibility, but we also want to make sure that that corn silage is not too short because we still need to provide enough physical effective fiber in the rumen to create that rumen mat. And if our corn silage is too short, we're not going to be able to achieve that. So getting the right chop length and also ensuring that kernel processing is done really, really well is really critical if you're going to be feeding a high corn silage diet. Um, Along with that, choosing a corn silage variety, if you have that luxury year ahead of time, that's very digestible and yields well is also key to that, right? We want to choose, you know, varieties that are not only high in starch, so we get that energy coming from the starch, but we also want varieties that the fiber is going to be quite digestible because that digestible fiber within that corn plant is actually a major source of energy for the cow as well. So we kind of want the best of both worlds. We want that starch and we want that fiber digestibility. Uh, along with that, some considerations would be, uh, you know, making sure that TMR mixing is up to snuff and really, really good. And sometimes if we go very, very high on the corn silage in the diet, like if we're getting closer to that, you know, 85, 90, or even above that corn silage as a forage source in the diet, then we're probably going to need to think about feeding some supplemental fat in order to have enough energy in that diet. And that's simply because corn silage in and of itself is actually quite high in fiber. So even though it's, you know, our, our energy forage, if we have so much of it, we're probably not actually going to have the energy density that we need. So sometimes feeding supplemental fat with high corn silage diets is a nice way to get, you know, different energy sources. We've got this energy from the start from the corn silage, we've got energy coming from digestible fiber, and we can get some fat-based energy in that. Uh, along with that, uh, BMR tends or lends itself really, really nicely to high corn silage diets simply because of that fiber digestibility, right? The available energy in BMR cannot be beat by, you know, most conventional varieties of corn silage. So that would be one thing I'd consider, especially if going to a high corn silage diet. Also, I think with BMR, if you're going to, you know, choose that tech that technology in your cropping plan, it lends itself to a high corn silage diet anyways, because if we're gonna make that investment in BMR, we wanna utilize it. So you might as well do that with a high corn silage diet. Absolutely agree. I think you nailed it when you talked about that investment aspect, right? You know, investing in BMR to get the payback, it makes sense it should take up more of the diet. So it has more of an influence on, on the, the you know, feed ration of the, the cow. Is it, would it be fair to say that one of the other considerations is we should probably really That's make correct. sure we have a good overlap in our, our feed storage if we're going to go to a high corn silage diet to make sure that we have that fermented feed for um, the whole time, keep things consistent? 
Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, Ashley. Um, I mean, especially in a high corn silage diet, if we're going into fresh feed this time of year, it's going to be a large percentage of the diet that is changing, right? And we can run into upset rumens and that kind of fresh corn silage slump that we used to traditionally go through, or sometimes producers still struggle with, especially if they're in a tower silo situation. So having that carryover on fermentation, I mean, in an ideal world, world, we'd be close to four months of fermented feed available on farm before we get in into it. So that means, you know, not getting into fresh corn silage in the fall, but making sure that we're getting into that in January, February would be really, really ideal. But at the very least, having, you know, four to six weeks of fermented feed on hand is really going to help, you know, get the bulk of that fermentation done before you move uh, into it. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think while we're sitting here talking about fermented feed, it's probably important for us to differentiate that you can do a really good job or a real poor job with your fermented feed, right? Yeah, that that that's correct. And and there, there's so many different factors that uh, play into fermentation, Ashley. And it, it really depends on the the forage type and the situation. But if we're talking about corn silage, right, we want to make sure we get that dry matter correct, right? Because dry matter or, or water is very, very critical in order to get the, the best fermentation possible, right? So we don't want to make, we want to make sure that that forage isn't too wet, but also that it isn't too dry, right? And the reason we're doing that is because if it's too dry, it's not going to pack well. And if it's too wet, that probably means that we took that corn silage too immature and we're not getting that full bang for our buck on starch. Uh, so the other thing that we're thinking about when we're aiming for really good fermentation is our packing, especially in a bunker or a drive over pile situation, right? So we want thin six inch layers driven over and over and over as much as possible in order to get a really, really good uh, pack in our corn silage with our corn silage that's at the right dry matter and that has been chopped at the correct chop length. So when we're looking at bunk density, for example, on a corn silage pile, we're aiming for at least 15 pounds uh, per, per cubic foot of dry matter. Perfect. Yeah, that's a so, great tip. That, uh, that comment about, you know, packing well, ensuring that fermentation, particularly important right now as we get ready to, to enter into corn silage within the next you know, few days, right? We should be checking that whole plant moisture. The other thing I would probably comment on is, is taking a mm -hmm. look at that cob and looking at that milk line and taking a gander at, you know, how advanced it is and seeing, you know, if you're comfortable in a range of moisture, say, you know, 35 to 37 dry matter, maybe wait a couple more days and advance that milk line a little bit more to get a little more starch. Yeah, that's right. I think it's this time of year, if you're in that low 30s in the dry matter, every extra day is going to get you a percentage point of starch, right? Yep, yep, you got it Especially exactly. Especially sugars convert over within the kernel. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's very, very important. For sure, for sure. So if we talk about, you know, we, maybe we could switch gears here and talk about something like alfalfa. How would you manage alfalfa you know, optimally to make sure that we're going to maintain that profitability on farm. I think alfalfa has gotten a little bit of a bad rap in recent years for its ability to die through the winter. Um, and so is there anything that we could, you know, should we be replacing it or should we just be managing it a little, a little differently to, to, you know, keep it a part of the ration? What do you think about alfalfa? I, I really like alfalfa. It's got a number of wonderful properties that make it really, really useful in dairy rations one it's it's so dang consistent compared to a lot of the other crops that we can we can grow especially if we get pure or closer to pure alfalfa stands uh, protein on it is very very good compared to a lot of the other legume or different uh, you know haylage type crops that we can grow out there and also fiber digestibility is quite good on it right grass is obviously more digestible than alfalfa but the the yield difference that we can get with alfalfa, if managed correctly, is going to far, far outweigh grass in a lot of situations, unless it's a, an area where there is lots of moisture available for those grasses to really thrive and grow. Um, I mean, I think winter kill and those sorts of things can be managed. I think that fall harvest period is very, very critical around that, and also making sure that we take our alfalfa stands out of rotation at the right time, right? Oftentimes I see producers complaining about winter kill issues or alfalfa when they're running five or six year stands. And 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I think kind of the best producers are doing that three to four years in an alfalfa stand and then they're making sure to rotate it out whether or not the stand looks good or not still, right? So that's going to have a huge impact on uh, winter kill. Also looking at your soil fertility, health, pH, all that sort of stuff is going to be really critical in, to ensuring that that alfalfa crop is as healthy as possible for as long as possible. When it comes yeah, to thinking about alfalfa, go ahead. Do you have a question? I was just going to jump in real quick and say, um, you know, you talk about rotating those stands out at the right time. You talked about measuring things earlier and, and I really like measuring my alfalfa stands. So instead of just visually looking at the stand and saying, oh, it's green, it's good to go, actually getting in there, counting the plants, you know, counting the stems as well as the crowns and getting an actual idea of what's there. Is it alfalfa? Is it grass? Is it weeds? And putting an actual hard stop on, you know what, if I get below you know, this number of crowns per foot, it's not going to yield well enough. So I think we can carry that measuring concept into our alfalfa fields. Yeah, that's a really, really, really great point. So the, uh, the other consideration with alfalfa is I think over the past 10, 15 years, there's been a real push, you know, to, you know, cut on, cut on the calendar, right? You know, get our first cut off as early as possible in the spring and then cut every 28 days after that and get as much kind of high pro quality, high protein alfalfa as we can. And I think I'm seeing a bit of a switch back the other direction. It's something that I'm really excited about, right? And it's, it's aiming for, you know, if we're doing, you know, four or five cuts before, maybe we're doing three or four cuts now on the alfalfa. And the reason we're doing that is because when we get those really rocket fuel halogens that test 25, 26% protein, 24% protein, and they don't have a lot of fiber in them, that protein isn't always usable for the cow. And when we're talking about, you know, costs and diets, often producers key in on protein costs is the number one thing that they want to cut. But what's actually the most expensive nutrient in a dairy diet is typically energy. And where does energy come from in our hay crop? It comes from the NDF and it comes from the digestibility of that NDF. So if we can get NDF at the right stage and we can get it at the really digestible stage, then we're going to have a really good alfalfa that's actually probably going to support milk production better than one of those rocket fuel uh, halages that we've often seen in the past. So what that typically means for most guys is aiming for around that on a pure alfalfa stand, aiming for around a 40% NDF is going to give us a really nice balance of fiber and also fiber digestibility, which is really going to drive energy availability and milk production uh, for the cow. Along with that, with first cut, I would say that, you know, evaluating your pure alfalfa stands with a peak stick is probably going to be your best way to, you know, evaluate when the best time is to cut. Um, if you're working with a mixed stand, you're probably looking at the percentage of the grass in the field and we want to hit that grass when it's probably closer to that boot stage or just starting to head out. So in a mixed 50-50 stand, typically that occurs when the alfalfa is about probably 22 to 25 inches tall, call it 24 inches. So, and if we do that, you know, we wait a little bit longer between cuts, we're probably going to get about the same yield across the entire cropping year, but we're going to get a little bit higher quality in terms of an energy and a digestibility standpoint, which is really going to pay dividends when it comes to feeding our dairy herds for the rest of the year. And the other neat aspect to that from the agronomy side of things is that, you know, we I've been trying to manage expectations of how long an alfalfa field is going to live um, because I think maybe our expectations as farmers is uh, we've, we've outgrown where we, the reality of that is and so instead of you know saying I want five years let's frame it in, in number of cuts and so if you, you produce one cut per year that alfalfa is just going to get a chance to fill those root reserves a little bit more you're stressing it less so you might actually prolong that life of that alfalfa stand a little bit more by not stressing it with that aggressive cutting schedule. So I like it from that aspect too. Hmm. I've never thought of it that way. That's really neat. One of the things that you mentioned was, you know, the, the value or that, that energy was one of the, the more limiting nutrients in terms of costs on a, on a diet. And I think one of the things that we can get from both alfalfa and corn silage is those fermentation byproducts, right? Mm -hmm, the VFAs. Yeah, yeah. So 
what kind of things, you know, is it just doing a really good job with packing and fermenting and harvesting that's going to influence those? Uh, for, the, for the most part. So when, when I talk about, you know, getting the right VFA production for both our fermenting corn silage and inhalages, we talk about the three bad things that hurt VFA production, hurt fermentation overall, and hurt the end energy value or, or energy available in that silage, and it's water, dirt, and air. So I think we touched on it a little bit before with getting the right dry matter for good fermentation. And also so that we can get it packed well, which limits that air, right? We want that oxygen that's left in the silage, if it's at the right dry matter, to go away very, very quickly at the start of that fermentation process. And the third really bad thing is dirt, right? Ash. So when we're looking, say, at an alfalfa stand, we want to keep that ash well below, or an alfalfa halage, we're trying to keep that ash or grass halage well below that 10%. And, and ash can come from many sources of contamination, right? It can come from, you know, driving too fast when we're cutting, skimming the ground too short, right? You know, not, not leaving that uh, correct stubble height when we're mowing. It can come from not cleaning up that feed pad very well before we're putting feed in the bunk. It can come from dusty roads. It can come from even dust and dirt on tractors and mowers and wagons and all that sort of stuff. It can come from manure contamination. Many, many different sources of ash, but what ash does is it carries bacteria with it, which are really going to alter the fermentation patterns that we see in our ensiling crops, right? What we're aiming for in both corn silage and haylage is higher levels of lactic acid or the right level amount of lactic, a lactic acid because lactic acid producing bacteria I'm going to call our good bacteria. In uh, corn silage and haylage we want to have a little bit of acetic acid producing bacteria but not a whole lot because acetic acid bacteria in uh, both corn silage and haylage is soil borne, right, which means that we've had some ash contamination there. And the third one that we want to really limit in haylage especially is butyric acid or butyric acid producing bacteria. In haylage, that comes from when the forage is really wet, say less than 30% dry matter, that typically comes with really wet forages, but sometimes we see butyric pop up uh, in our fermentation reports in haylage that's at say 50% dry matter and, and producers are scratching their heads and wondering why. And typically if we've got a dry haylage and a high level butyric, that means we've probably got a severe ash contamination or a dirt in the silage contamination. Mm. One other thing that we can do to help with those VFAs in order to make sure that we're getting the levels that we want in our different forages is really investing in a good inoculant. I think, and I, I believe Pioneer's got a bunch of those, so. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. We've got some for the front end fermentation, some for the back end. So when you're looking on farm, how often do you look at, you know, recommending an inoculant? I recommend, recommend an inoculant in pretty much every situation, but keeping in mind that, you know, an inoculant isn't going to fix a poor forage, right? So we need to get our management around getting that, that forage into the silo or into the bunk correct first and then a, an inoculant is going to make a good forage a lot better. One, it's going to limit dry matter loss, right? So the amount of tons that we put into the bunker silo versus the tons that we get out, an inoculant is going to help with that. And two, depending on the inoculant, it's going to help with different situations, right? We're talking about that front end fermentation and that's for dry matter loss or back end fermentation, right? That's for keeping that face or bunk stable as we're feeding out, right? So I believe the Buckner eye type inoculants are actually going to increase that acetic acid number. And that's different than what I talked about before when I said acetic acid producing bacteria, because if we have acetic acid producing bacteria without an inoculant that uh, promotes them, that's not a good thing. But if we're adding an inoculant like Bucknerai that promotes those acetic acid producing bacteria, that just means that at feed out, that face is going to be really stable. It's going to reduce that heating because heating during feed out is basically uh, uh, a back end fermentation or a restarting of those bacteria, those molds, those yeasts, all those things in there that are actually utilizing up some of that available energy in the silage. So I think different situations lend themselves to different inoculants, right? So if your goal is to get that forage fermented as quickly as possible because you're taking a foot off that face every day or you're, you're slamming through a bag real, real quick, then you might not need to look at a Buckner eye inoculant or something that's 
designed for a back end fermentation. You want to probably look at something that's going to uh, get as much lactic acid to stabilize that feed as quickly as possible. But if you're, you know, like many dairy farms in Ontario, you've got a bunk that's 25 or 30 or 40 feet wide, and it's taking you a couple of days to get across the face. And you're not taking that six or eight inches of silage off every day. Then if, if you experience issues with heating on your bunk face or in your silage, then looking at a back end fermenter is probably going to be something that's a really good investment for you on your dairy operation. Yeah, I think you nailed it perfectly. You know, we don't always need the same inoculant for every farm. And I think the last thing that I would comment is, you know, if BMR is maybe not an option for you, but you're still looking for that increased fiber technology or fiber digestibility, you know, we have a product that can help with that to help improve that digestibility on that farm, keep those intakes up and help those cows get the most out of those feeds. So that's kind of a, an interesting option as well. I think the last feed that we should touch on is probably mm -hmm, for sure, you know, high moisture corn. Um, we're coming up to that time right now too. What kind of are your, some of your best management practices for that? It's pretty easy to go sideways with high moisture corn, isn't it? It, it can be, and it, it's, it's really not that different than uh, managing your forage crops. Number one is get that moisture right. Right. If it's too dry, it's not going to ferment in the silo. If it's too wet, it's going to run and create a great create a great big stinking mess, and it's going to probably almost rot and not really ferment either. So, depending on how you're storing it, right? If we've got a a big old blue harvest store and we're putting it in a hole and rolling it on the way out, or we're grinding it into a bag or a bunk, it doesn't really matter. But we got to get the moisture right for the structure that we're storing it in, and then when we are processing it, uh, we want to make sure that that grind size is small and that we're, we're getting in there and limiting oxygen. And then face management in a bunk or a bag is very critical with high moisture corn so that we don't get mold and things like that growing into it because it, there's not often that many bunks in Ontario with high moisture corn where we're getting a huge amount off the face every day, right? As compared to say a corn silage or a haylage bunk. No, absolutely. I totally agree. And, you know, I think that there's just that much more fuel for the bugs because it's such a highly concentrated starch and sugar source. So you really got to make sure that you're, you're managing that, that feed storage super, super carefully. So I think we've talked, you know, a lot about feed on farm and how that's, that can be something we can manage in the short term to kind of cut back on some of those feed costs. But I know that's what I talk about day to day. Something that you would talk about on the day to day basis would be a lot more to do with, you know, the animals and are they actually eating what they need to eat and, uh, you know, lying down as often as they need to lie down. What are some mm -hmm. like typical short term things that, you know, farmers can go out and do right now. I can run out to the barn and check tonight in terms of improving, you know, my bottom line sooner rather than later. I, I think it kind of comes down to the basics of uh, like stockmanship and, and welfare and health, right? We need to look at the water available, like water, air, light, space, rest, and feed, right? So we've touched a lot on feed and forages and that sort of stuff, but making sure that we got enough water available for our cows, right? Oftentimes in free stall barns or in tie stall barns, water is one of the biggest limiting things on a dairy operation. So in those of you, for those of you in tie stall barns, we're looking for 16 to 18 liters per minute of flow rate coming out of those water bowls. And most water bowls in most tie stall barns do not meet that metric, right? So it's, cleaning the lines out, it's moving to bigger lines, it's moving to high flow bowls so that we're not limiting cows on water take or water intake, especially in the summer months. In freestall barns, I believe the old metric used to be two inches of linear water space per cow and now I'm recommending closer to four inches of linear water space per cow in order to have enough water access uh, for those cows throughout the barn and also two water bowls per pen. Right, so that we don't get one cow who's a boss cow kind of guarding that water bowl and keeping other cows uh, out of there. Uh, light's also very important, right? I don't like to eat in the dark at the kitchen table by myself. That's pretty depressing and c cows don't like to do that either. So having lots of light on that feed bunk and throughout the barn is uh, is really critical. It's, it's cooled down a bit here in uh, southwestern Ontario, but it's still you know, that 20, 24 degrees Celsius. And we know that biologically cows get heat stressed probably around 18 degrees Celsius. So 
having lots of air movement, fans going, all that sort of stuff is going to really help with that heat stress throughout the summertime and help those cows stay comfortable, cool, lying down and making milk. Uh, when it comes to rest, making sure that stall sizes are correct, we've got lots of bedding in there. If we're in a deep bedded situation, making sure that sand or manure solids or shavings or straw or whatever we're deep bedding with is not below the height of the curb so that we can encourage lying time is really critical, right? Cows make milk when they're lying down. So when I walk into a barn at any time of the day, you know, remove from feeding time or milking time, I want to see, you know, 70 to 80% of those cows lying down. So if you walk into your barn at two in the afternoon and you've got half the herd standing up or just standing around doing nothing, then I think that's a key cow signal that you need to figure out what's going on here. Is it there? Are we restricting them on you know, air because it's heat stress in the summertime. Are they looking for feed? Are they uncomfortable with the stalls? Do they not like the dimensions of the stalls or the bedding that's in there? It's all those sort of things that we can look at very quickly in order to, you know, kind of try to focus in and key on, key in on, on efficiency and profitability on your dairy farm. Yeah, so it's all about making sure that that cow can, can lie down and can eat a lot. Those are kind of the, the two things that she should be doing most of the day, right? Yeah, cow, cows do three things. They, they lie down, they eat, they get milked. If they're standing around doing nothing, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. That makes sense to me. Man, I think we've covered a pretty wide range of topics. I'm not sure, Stacy. do there happen to be any questions? I did have a couple come through, but um, your discussion already touched on the answer, so... All right. Perfect. Nothing, uh, <laughs> right on. Perfect. I guess, Mike, before we segue. I, I, think, I think one more oh. thing. Nope. Go, Matt. Oh, I was going to say, I think, I think w one more thing that, you know, has been in conversation a lot this year is alternative forages, right? When we're mm -hmm. looking at inventory, I think we talked a little bit about at the beginning about, you know, high corn silage diet to make up for poor forage inventories, but there's been a lot of chatter out there about, you know, different forages or different crops that we can grow uh, in order to stretch those feed inventories. And probably the number one that I, one that I turn to is growing a winter annual and then and chopping that in the spring, whether that's uh, in most situations, I like rye for that simply because of the tonnage potential on it, but triticale is another option and, and different things like that. So oftentimes producers, when I suggest something like that, go like, why would I do that? That only buys me two or three weeks worth of feed in the spring. And yes, that's true. But in years like this, you might need that two or three weeks of extra feed. And the other thing it does is it allows you to kind of help build that forage inventory over time. So you can consider it as an insurance policy of basically extra feed that you know you're gonna have next year so that it helps you to build up your reserves and stocks of corn silage and haylage once again. So any thoughts from you, Ash, on different feeds or different, different things out there? Yeah, I think that's a great comment, Matt. And I think uh, we could look at a couple of key things. The first for me is um, you know, we can't expect to rebuild three years of tough, uh, tough forage years overnight. We can't expect to suddenly have an incredible year and rebuild those inventories. We kind of have to play a little bit of the long game here. So make sure we have enough feed for now. But like you said, incrementally add more and more every year to increase. I think that's a, that's a good point. The other thing for me looking at a winter annual is that uh, it's going to break up that crop rotation a little bit. You know, you can go corn, a winter annual, and then go back to corn you've put a nice cover crop in there for the winter, which is always a great thing, but you've also put in a different crop to break up any, you know, host uh, problems that you might have for bugs or, or disease. It's not kind of nice to shake things up there. So two opportunities from the winter aspect. If we look at some of the summer annuals that we, you know, are often growing, um, I think we have to remember that there's a reason alfalfa has been grown so extensively for so long. And that's just because it, it really does a lot of things well, like you kind of already touched on. It has that yield, it has that digestibility, it's got the quality to it. Um, so it makes sense to keep going back to alfalfa, even if it's a little bit of a pain in the butt sometimes. Um, you know, we can look at doing some urgent, like sowing oats and peas over top to get, you know, a cut a few weeks earlier. Um, I'm okay with that, but I think you have to remember that 
anytime you companion crop, you're, you're stealing some resources away from that alfalfa. So you're really not giving it the best start that you possibly could. My, my preference is to, to seed alfalfa by itself, give it a really good chance to get going and hopefully it'll be able to stick around a little longer. So that was what leads me to the winter annual idea a little bit more. And I think, you know, I mentioned it earlier, the other comment is that corn silage is going to be your highest yielding. So if you really need to rebuild those inventories as fast as possible, I would be looking at how you can incorporate just a little bit more of that corn silage into your diet uh, and into your rotation to really rebuild things quickly and then maybe get a reset and reevaluate from there. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. So I think those are all great yeah. points. Yeah, it's certainly the, the, win the emergency forages has been you know, one of the top questions of, well, well, can I grow blank? And it's like, well, you can grow it, but is it worth growing it? I think one of the other things that we can do when we look at, look at our acreage is, you know, yeah, sure, you can put an alfalfa crop on it, and if it's only at 60%, you know, that's 60%, sure, but what's the opportunity cost of keeping alfalfa in that field? You know, what's the nitrogen credit if you shuffled it into corn silage or, you know, what if you turned it into soybeans and, and sold it elsewhere? There's other things that you have to look at just because something's there doesn't mean it's actually the best option. And so sometimes we kind of need to take a step back and think outside yeah. of the box. Maybe it's cheaper to, to buy in, you know, your hay from someone who has better luck growing it than you and, and sell soybeans instead. Uh, there, we kind of maybe can get creative on on some of these other options. Mm -hmm. So I think we're running out of, well, we're winding down a little bit here. We have a hard stop at five, four. Does anyone have any last comments before we get, uh, get wound up here? I guess I'm going to have to go back and reevaluate uh, why I've got peas and oats in my alfalfa when I started my <laughs> alfalfa. So uh, should have called so me, Mike. Jeez. I should have. So, <laughs> but both of you give me. You know, I wish this is, this is certainly something. You know, obviously not adding much to the uh, the science of, of of farming for sure. But um, I think this is you know just in the conversation between the two of you, a couple of takeaways for me. Number one, I mean, I recognize quite clearly that farming is very complex and there's a lot more to it than maybe the public recognizes. Number two is there's a lot of knowledge sitting here between the two of you. And number three is you give me great faith and hope uh, that you're, I mean, you're on the younger side of uh, <coughs> 40. I'm on the <coughs> other side of 40. You, uh, and I know you're nowhere near 40, Matt. That's <laughs> not what I'm saying. So just dividing life into 40 above, 40 below. You, you both give me, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of confidence that I recognize that with the type of individuals like yourselves and the knowledge base that you have, uh, that indeed, uh, you know, that, uh, that dairy and in a broader context, agriculture with uh, uh, the, the, the knowledge base that you have, you give me great hope that we can continue to be able to make sure that agriculture serves, uh, serves Canadians well. So I couldn't obviously add to anything, but um, I learned a few things um and uh we often talk about matt as three things that employees want uh they almost mesh with, with the three things your cows need to so but we'll leave it at that so <laughs> i'm very uh, i'm very very impressed and uh and uh you give me great hope so thanks mike i really appreciated your your kind of overview on the industry you certainly come at it from an ass angle that um, I can't speak for Matt, but I spend so much time on the farm level that I sometimes forget about what happens to the milk after it leaves the lane. So that was a good introduction. And, you know, Matt, I'll jump in and say, I really appreciate, uh, you know, you, you talked a ton about forages, which is obviously my favorite thing, but uh, tying it back together at the end in, in terms of, you know, animal welfare. And you can put a lot of good feed in front of the cows, but it doesn't matter if those cows aren't, aren't comfortable in eating. So I appreciate you jumping in on that. And That's right. You know, that that you have. Well, th thank you both. I really appreciated being a part of this today. It was a lot of fun, so. All right, well, thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Michael Barrett, Matt Groen, Ashley Napton, and to all our at attendees. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to sit with us and join the discussion. Uh, if there are no last uh, minute 
questions here. Uh, we will go ahead and wrap it up and uh, always feel free to reach out to any of our panelists with any of your questions. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Have a great day.